Uh, good evening, folks. Thank you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have Nancy Ulray, who is a, I hope I pronounced that right, Nancy. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, who's the executive director of the Cash Creek Conservancy. Uh, we wanted to have Nancy speak with us uh, before, after, af after I saw her speak at my, uh, heard her speak at my California Naturalist class, I thought, uh, you know, hear hearing about the current um, goings on at the Conservancy and the Preserve, uh, I think would be good since some of us bird out there and it'd be good to know what, what they're doing out there. Uh, so uh, I've asked her to come and speak with us tonight and, and I'm glad she uh, agreed. So like she's the executive director um, and you know, she's fascinated with the diversity of birds uh, out at the preserve. And uh, we have some folks working with her staff and trying to uh, you know, do bird lists and, and uh, facilitate the experience of other people who go birding out there. Uh, so, you know, since being in this job, she's learned a lot about birds uh, and during her time there. And, and uh, I think she's enthusiastic about becoming, a, uh, you know, a, a proficient birder. Uh, but um, we wanna hear about her, her birding skills, but also about uh, what's going on at the, uh, preserve and conservancy and uh, some ways that uh, our, our organizations can, can work together to uh, uh, bring the, you know, the experience of nature uh, to the general public who uh, are curious and we hope they would uh, come out there and see what's going on. So Nancy, uh, give you the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ken. And thank you all very much for first your patience as I've become um, more adept at, at, uh, at Zoom meetings. And, um, and I really appreciate the invitation to talk to you tonight about the um, Cache Creek Nature Preserve and the Cache Creek Conservancy. Um, just really briefly, we, we um, discussed about I'll tell you a little bit about the nature preserve. I don't know how much people really know, so you'll some of it may be repetitive. Um, and so I appreciate your patience with that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about current birding activity and uh, and then maybe some of some of the things that we're hoping to do in the future at the nature preserve around birds and birding. And um, and I really want to start with a um, making sure to talk about our partnership with the Yellow Audubon Society. Um, the, the Conservancy at the Nature Preserve have worked frequently with, with uh, Yellow Audubon on several projects. Most recently, um, we were partners on a wetland island reshaping to be more hospitable habitat for, for uh, birds. And uh, that was successfully completed a couple of years ago. And then the Cape Open Space Park uh, bird nest um, boxing. That was a, another partnership recently that we had with Yellow Audubon. So, so we've done a lot of good things together in the past and we're looking forward to doing many more good things together in the future. So uh, the Jan T. Lowry Cache Creek Nature Preserve, um, many of you probably know about the, um, the gravel wars, really um, the whole nature preserve idea came out of the, the peace plan at the end of a 20 year gravel war. And, and I do really need to do a big shout out to Ann Bryce because um, she was part of the, if you can't, if you wanna say it, the, the reconciliation process uh, between the, the stakeholders, she was part of that group. And she was actually the Conservancy's first executive director. So when I tell people I stand on the shoulders of giants, She's one of the giants um, so um, who, who preceded me and helped guide the, the nature preserve forward. Uh, Jan Lowry um, did the initial restoration of the nature preserve and then Linnell Pollock followed. And then I came on board when she retired. Uh, the nature preserve, and this is a little map show, showing the different habitat types we have. Um, uh, we managed that under a, an MOU with the Yolo County. Yolo County actually owns the property. We just manage it. And, um, and like I said, we have, uh, well, we have different habitat types. We have the managed wetland, which used to be the gravel pit. 
Um, we have the riparian corridor. We have an oak savanna. You can't, I can't really see it because of the um, zoom thing. And then, um, and then our native grasslands. We also kind of highlight the tending and gathering garden because even though it's not necessarily a separate habitat type, um, uh, it is a special, special place. And we do see a lot of um, flora and fauna there um, native to, to California, of course. So just looking at my notes, trying to keep my cat from jumping on the, the uh, computer too. So uh, a little bit more about the restored wetland habitat. Again, like I said, it was the, um, uh, or originally was the, the gra gravel pit, the main gravel pit. These wetland islands we we discovered uh, when they were initially made were too, the slopes were too high for the waterfowl to really effectively use. Uh, they were originally designed to be um, bre breeding grounds for, for migratory waterfowl, but they never used it. The deer love them. Uh, they swim out to them, but the, the geese and stuff, they never actually build um, uh, nests on, on the islands. And so uh, James Mizuguchi, who's the habitat restoration manager at the time, um, did some research and found out that the, the side slopes were too high. So we applied for a North American wetlands restoration grant and in partnership with several other organizations, including Yellow, Habit, uh, Yellow, um, Yellow Audubon. And we resloped, there's 10 islands, we resloped about seven of them. And so we are seeing more bird activity, especially on the, on the lower slopes. And then as, as the water went down, we actually saw a lot more uh, for a while while we still had water for the first time since um, since the wetlands were built, um, uh, they did they did go dry this past past summer. So uh, for a while there, the birds had a feast because all the all the fish that was in the habit in the wetland died. But then after a while, we didn't see anybody. Uh, we've seen uh, white pelicans there, eagles, ospreys come by, but mostly we have cormorants and and um, this time of year, um, those kinds of birds here. It's also habitat for Western pond turtle and giant garter snakes. The oak savanna um, is, we have historic oaks in there over a hundred years old. It, it orig originally this, the, this kind of oak wood, wooded area would have reached almost a mile from the creek. Um, certainly it doesn't do that anymore. Um, parts of it were recently burned as part of a the Layak Po, and I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, but, you know, it's really um, a vibrant place, lots of birds and a lot of bird nest boxes. We have um, uh, bluebird boxes and um, and some owl boxes out in, out in that area. Uh, grassland habitat, again, it's uh, it's also, we have a Swainson's Hawk easement on those grasslands. We have a nice rafter of wild turkeys roaming through. And we, again, have some owl boxes and some other boxes. We actually did have a Swainson's Hawk nesting pair just outside of the grassland area. So that was really exciting for us in, in 2022. And then the riparian habitat, as you can can see that's that's the Greek, the creek habitat, and um, and again we just finished a forty acre restoration um, grant on on the nature preserve, and we also do a lot of work within the creek for the um, invasive weed control, um, trying to make space for for naturalized uh, restoration at this point in time. We also worked with the County Board of Supervisors on the, um, on the uh, restrictions for off-highway vehicles because we were concerned about, about the um, breeding ground loss and the loss of, because we were noticing um, uh, less killdeer um, and other ground nesting birds weren't as prevalent as they had been in the last year. Uh, last few years. And so in 2021, the um, 
the board of supervisors restricted and we actually in 2022 uh saw an increase in in uh killed their killed their uh successful successful nesting so we were really excited to see that um and then just by just for those of you who don't know headwaters of uh, the cash creek is in clear lake and the clear lake um or the the cash creek watershed is 107 miles long and about 745,000 miles uh, or 745,000 acres big uh, sphere of influence how wetlands work you probably all know that but just to kind of let you know that you know we Cache Creek is kind of designated as the upper Cache Creek. Then there's the Cape A Dam area, which was right around just between um, Rumsey and, and Esparto, and then um, closer to Rumsey, and then lower Cache Creek. And our sphere of influence is still mostly lower Cache Creek, although we do work within the whole um, watershed, just to kind of give you an, an idea of that. Um, the Cache Creek Nature Preserve, like I said, was is 130 acres of wildlife habitat owned by the county, managed by the Conservancy. The Conservancy is a nonprofit. A lot of times people merge the two and they talk of us as one and we are hugely connected, but we are kind of different entities, if you will. Um, and so with the Conservancy, our mission is to re preserve, restore, and enhance the Cache Creek watershed. We say it a lot of different ways. And we do that primarily through restoration work, through education, and, and then again, the tending and gathering garden. We're really pleased with that. So restoration, we just kind of define as actions to restore the landscape to a former condition. And, um, and I've given you some examples of how we do that. Monitoring is is a new, uh, or I, sh I shouldn't say it's new, but it's it's right now kind of a primary focus along with education and land management. It's named after Jan Lowry, who uh, followed Anne as the executive director. He died suddenly, and that's when Linnell took over. And so um, he was, this is uh, Jan watching the wetland islands being built. And so there's kind of a before and after effect there. Um, and so then to talk about our education program, uh, because again, this is where I think uh, the Conservancy and uh, Audubon really work well together is helping people understand the importance of, of um, education and, and birds and how birds are, are um, a good indicator of the health of an ecosystem. Uh, right now, our our big push is on our college internships and Harnamaz uh, Boparai, who I don't know if he's on on online tonight or not, but I know you're familiar with him. He was very uh, instrumental in helping us revamp our internship program, and it's going really, really well. Uh, we also do something we call the Tending and Gathering Garden Traditional uh, Ecological Knowledge, or TGG Tech. Um, which is uh, helping people understand um, from a Native American perspective, how they did their, their different cultural practices. Experience the Creek is really what we call our, our elementary school program, which has not been operative over the last two or three years. And then we have like life enrichment too. So the things we talk about and experience the Creek, earth science, life science, social science. So we kind of try to give people a, a complete understand, give young children complete um, uh, experience of what it's like to be on the creek, something they don't get in the classroom when we do it with activity stations like you see here. Um, tending and gathering garden, again, it was one of the first that we're aware of. Um, the, the woman who um, started um, the TGG uh, was a doctoral student at Berkeley, at not, not Berkeley, I'm sorry, at UC Davis and Shannon uh, Brawley. And uh, when she first floated this idea of planting a, a part in a, in, a, in a nature preserve, just uh, with California native plants um, for the benefit of 
uh, Native American cultural practitioners for food fiber and, and basket weaving. Um, her first, um, her first uh, uh, doctoral um, person uh, rejected it and said, who, who cares about that? Who wants to know about that? This was in the early 2000s. But um, anyway, she persevered and we have this beautiful site. Here's some people, just some um, common things. And then I won't even uh, embarrass myself or anybody else by trying to say that the that, that, uh, Winton language, but we have a sign that leads into this that um, gives expression to actually what we think about the for the whole preserve, but certainly for the TGG, which is when you enter, leave the new world outside, walk, smell, look, and listen, and you will leave with a good spirit. So that's what we're hopeful for everybody here. Um, Layak Po is Wintun for good fire. We just had a, a huge uh, workshop uh, this past November um, where we taught, uh, where our Na the Native American cultural experts that we work with taught 130 um, fire fire crew fighters and other interested people how to do a cultural burn. And cultural burns um, are, are similar to, but not the same as what used to be called prescribed burns. Now they're called beneficial burns. The language is changing a little bit about that, but it's not only about fuel load reduction. It's done at times and in a manner that um, actually is beneficial for the soil and for the plants and to help the plants um, regenerate in a certain way. And uh, so the, the laws have changed a little bit about, about um, cultural burns. And so we're helping, we're working with CAL FIRE to talk about this. Um, we actually did monitoring because they burned in areas where we have our wood deck boxes. Harnawas wrote a nice report and it is up should be up on our uh, website by now about um, about how the wood ducks response responded to the fire going around, but uh, but most of the hens did not abandon their nests, and um, and most of the nests were successful even after the fire. So we thought that was interesting um, to find out, and. Um, so you'll probably be hearing more about beneficial fire. The other thing about uh, uh, about the Native American way of uh, of burning is it tends to be a lower intensity fire. So when you use uh, like petroleum based fuels to light the fire, they tend to be a lot hotter. And so these fi fires tend not to be as hot. So that might be one of the things. And of course, we have many fire adapted native plants at the Nature Preserve, which of course, they're native plants, so the native birds, insects, and everything. So we're, we're looking for the whole ecosystem functionality um, of this part of Cache Creek. Oops. Uh, so some additional information. Here's here's the piece that I know this is this is what you really want to know about. Um, so we have at least more than seventy three um, species of birds that are. Um, that are routinely spotted throughout the creek uh, or th at, throughout the, the nature preserve. And uh, we're, we, we have a little bird list that people can come to the office and we'll, we're happy to give them. We also have a bird ID card with photos for so people who are beginning birders and might need a little assistance have that. Um, we are uh, busy planning our great back backyard bird count. We've been doing that for about 17, 18 years now. So that's, as I'm sure you all know, February 17th and 20, and we plan on being open all four days for um, specific bird walks. And so um, I won't say that um, we replaced Harnawaz when he chose to, to um, pursue other uh, career endeavors, um, but we, we did hire somebody to uh, take that position. And so her name is Felicia Wong and she will be leading um, the bird walks for us. Uh, although, you know, nobody can replace Harnawas. And um, so we might even be able to entice him to come back. I'm not sure, but that, that might be fun. But we are, like I said, planning on um, 
on uh, doing at least having being open all four days for that. And we're working right now on a display to go into the yellow, uh, to the Woodland Library to help encourage people um, to come and, and do that. Um, I think you're aware that the uh, Conservancy, we had a board member who insisted on doing a Christmas bird count. And so I, uh, that got registered with the National Audubon Society. And um, I was told that 70 people participated. They noticed 138 species within the count circle um, uh, and 77 species uh, within the nature preserve. So again, that's within the consistent number that we, we see, seem to find. Um, we did... Uh, work with the Yellow County to open up uh, Corral Rogers, which was one of the um, first restoration sites I know Anne, brought, Anne was very involved in. Um, and they saw some what are considered rare birds, the California thrashers and fantail pigeons. So um, I thought you might be interested in that. Um, the other things we're doing, you know, the birds await will um, uh, pick back up in spring. That was our our introduction to bird bird watching and and just having just opening up the preserve on Saturday evenings so people could come and do bird watching. Then um, our our bird box monitoring interns have just started working on on um, on that, and so um, we're looking forward to that. And then one of the really exciting things um, that's happening is we have a couple of UCD doctoral students who are working on a three-year Black Phoebe study to see how uh, Black Phoebes are adjusting to habitat change from, from a rural environment to a more urbanized environment. And um, they're trying to figure out what, if any, behavioral changes um, might be affecting nesting success. So uh, they'll be looking at, among other things, aggression and curiosity. Um, they'll be banding adults. They'll be taking some DNA tests. They'll be setting up cameras. And so uh, we've agreed we're going to set up a, a web page to follow their study. So as soon as those get up, I'll make sure to let you all know that you can go to our website and follow uh, the students have agreed the, to, uh, you know, post uh, information to to a web page on our website so people can follow along. Um, so I think that's 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 exciting for us. Um, and then just some other things, you know, we have a lot of deer, um, snakes, um, just kind of things. So we're we're looking forward to to visits uh, from people. We're looking forward to partnering with the Yellow Habitat, but just kind of wanted to give you an, an overview of, of what's going on with the Conservancy right now. And um, again, that's the end of the slideshow. And I can stop sharing my screen if you when you want me to, um, but I'm happy to take questions or comments or ideas. What would you like to see at at the um, okay. happened I, at Cash Creek. I was talking and I didn't know I was muted. Okay, <clears throat> there was uh, there was some questions in the beginning that Harna was answered for those those folks, and I don't know <laughs> if everyone saw those. But the questions were the the location of the uh, <clears throat> preserve and the access point. Sure. So, so, um, so the the Cash Creek Nature Preserve is uh, address is three four one nine nine County Road twenty um, in Woodland. If you are familiar at all with Woodland um, and the Stallion Station, we're just right across the street from the Stallion Station. If you're familiar with the Flyers Club, we're down County Road ninety four B across the bridge. Hang hang a left at your first left, and then you'll you'll see the nature preserve. We do have a, a map and instructions on our website too on how to get there if you're not familiar with woodland. So, okay. And uh, Anawaz, uh, there was another question about the office, and I assume the office is 
is is located uh, close by. The to office is not meant to preserve. Oh, yes. The, yeah, yeah. The, okay. the the office, and you you come through the gate, and you get the full package. Our offices are there. Our um, programs are usually held there. Although sometimes we do programs offsite. Okay. So we have a two uh, a two part question uh, from Ian is how have the burned areas held up after the recent rains? Uh, the burned areas have done very well after the recent rains. So of course, everything's soggy. Um, I think the wind did more damage than the rains. Um, we did lose a couple of oak trees, uh, one in the oak savanna and one along uh, uh, East Adams Canal, West Adams Canal, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and, and a few branches in the riparian area, but actually we've, we've done, done pretty well. Good. The other part of this question was, uh, how did the preserve as a whole do with the high waters? Well, right now we're doing pretty good. It's not as high as, as it has been. Um, and it didn't, it didn't reach, we've had water reach up to the levee where the parking lot is. And so it didn't get nearly that, that close. So uh, we, until the floodwaters really recede, we won't really know the extent of like how much debris got moved down, mm -hmm. um, downstream, which can be problematic, but, um, yeah. but everything right now, uh, we think we we weathered this first round of storms pretty well. Excellent, excellent. Um, oh, here's a question that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, how much of a problem are snakes uh, on, when walking the trails? And I, I assume that means rattlesnakes. Uh, yeah, I would assume it means rattlesnakes too. Um, and right, well, right now, there's no problem with rattlesnakes because they're all kind of hibernating. Um, we try to keep the trails nice and clean so people can can see it. We just ask people to stay on the trails and you shouldn't have any problems um, um, because then usually the snakes, uh, if they're out in the trails, they're usually not coiled, um, although they can coil up pretty quickly, but then you get to see them and you can turn around and walk the other direction. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the key is just to always when I'm on trails like that, I'm always looking at the edges. Right, right. And, and we are trying to keep the trails wide enough without being too wide and, and uh, maintained well enough that, you know, people will notice that. But we are always cautious and we always tell people be cautious about snakes. Yeah. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, hopefully folks are thinking of some questions. Uh, but I have one looking at this picture here. And I may have missed it, and I apologize if I have. Um, how many um, school groups uh, do you do you have coming uh, to the preserve uh, during the school year? Um, well, so we have pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, and yes, <laughs> and so pre-pandemic we would have between three and 4,000 students. That's how we keep track. Uh -huh. uh, we'd have between three and 4,000 students within a, a, a school year. Um, during the shutdown, of course, there wasn't anybody visiting and they have not yet packed, picked back up. We've had um, a smattering of school groups come out, um, mostly homeschoolers, but a, a few public schools uh, but even so, not um, not to the extent that um, mm -hmm. we don't really have uh, too many things. Uh, Harnawaz and a volunteer, Diana Drip, did a, just a fantastic job of re, uh, revising and refreshing our visitor center. Unfortunately, that is probably the, the, the thing that did sustain the most damage because the roof leaked very badly and um, and so we're having to close the visitor center right now. And Oh, trying to um, staff is recommending strongly to the board uh, that we replace it because it is um, it it was purchased used and it's twenty three years old and, as yeah. it is so um, 
Okay. Are you getting good feedback from teachers or, uh, you know, maybe students in later years have, have uh, expressed their thanks for uh, participating in your programs? Um, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be, just be even, you know, grocery shopping or, or chatting with someone uh, outside of the nature preserve. And you mentioned, I mentioned, I, I worked there and people have great and wonderful things of uh, talking about their experience as a school child coming out and saying, oh, I should come back out and visit. Um, so, Excellent. so yeah, it's, 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 um, you know, and again, it's, it's the standing on the shoulders of giants. I can't take credit for anything that, um, that's, um, you know, that's nature and other people. And, you know, I just right. make sure the contracts are signed. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, back to critters, uh, Rose asks, are there, are giant garter snakes documented on the preserve? Yes, they are. Is there uh, anyone again, doing some studies? Um, I don't think anybody's done any studies that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. um, but but we have documented sightings of giant Good. garter snakes. Good. Okay. And Western pond turtles. I don't know if Michael is on the uh, is is on the meeting or not, but he and I used to work together at DWR, and Western pond turtles were a thing. Yeah, I, I was out there years ago, and I was. I was able to spot one out there. Okay, let's see, check in the chat. And yes, Michael is here. Oh, hi, Michael. <laughs> okay, uh, that's it for the questions. I have a um, question. Oh, okay. Um, hey, Nancy. Uh, great to great talk. Um, great to hear <laughs> from you as well. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Arna was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, out of curiosity, with the, the doctoral students that are studying the Black Phoebes, uh, like where are they coming from? Like what context are they looking at it from? Like you know, coming from an ecological context or behavioral context? Um, because you're, you're talking about how they're mentioning how they're res responding to what is it, urban versus non-urban yeah, environments. I think, I think they're looking at behaviors. That uh, that seems to be their focus. I mean, I'm sure they'll look at all different kinds of things and they are um, going to be very open that if people want to tag along as they do their their thing, they're happy to have our interns or or anybody who happens to be there. They 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 want to share, they want to share what they're doing with folks. So okay. Um uh, Nancy, you can stop sharing. Oh, uh, okay. Now. Good. But I, I just thought leaving that picture up would help generate some questions. So did you uh, see Suzanne's question, Ken, about I asking about hours? I oh there we are. Go ahead, Anne. Oh, uh, just uh, Nancy, uh, people are curious what the hours are when they can visit in days. Sure. We're we're right now we're currently open um eight to four. Um Four to four thirty. Staff leaves at four thirty, but we try to encourage people to leave before we're ready to go home. Um, so it's eight to four thirty Monday through. Uh, so I'm sorry, Sunday through Friday. Uh, the only day we're we're totally closed right now is Saturday. But again, the board is discussing about opening at seven days a week. Yeah. I have a, a question. Um, I'm still trying. I'm, I do not live in Woodland or Davis, um, but I have tried to find this area or I, you know, I could see it looked like an interesting place to visit, but uh, not really aware of the access points. If um, when I put in the address, does that address lead me to your office? The three four one nine nine County Road twenty. Um, it it will it will lead you to our front gate, and then our front gate. If you just follow the little roadway through, um, and we have a small sign saying, you know, parking this way, and you park in our parking lot, and then our office is just off the parking lot. It's uh, really just a, a it's a temporary construction building. Uh, uh, and so we have a visit, visit, visitor center and, and the, the construction type um, trailer 
So is the is the parking lot open at all times or is it blocked off when you're it's, not? It's locked. We lock the gates. We do have we do have gates, and so we are, we try to discourage access. Um, of course, we, we have game cameras up, and we we do know that people enter when we are officially closed. Um, but uh, we do try to discourage access again because it's it's considered a nature preserve and a wildlife sanctuary. So we do kind of want to give the animals a break from human beings uh, for for a little bit, and uh, hence why the board right now is debating whether or not closing one day a week is enough, or should or does it matter and should they be open seven days a week? So that's that's for the board to, to work out and to work with the county on. Thanks for your question, Joel. Okay. Yeah, I'm still just trying to figure out how to get there. So, um, so- From the South we, and wandered around, but yeah. From the South, so from the Davis area, it's a, it's a, I mean, I'm because I can give you directions from from, you know, uh, basically uh, from from the south. If you're coming like from the Vacaville, well, I mean, I'd, I'd be coming from from Woodland. But I'm you know, I'm looking at Google Maps and I and I sort of see it. I just need to try it and yeah. see if just actually take done. Highway 16. Um, I take the the County Road 22 exit, but you could go to County Road 94B. The landmark is to your right would be the flood control district office. Turn right onto 94B, follow 94B uh, all the way across the bridge. And then at County Road 20, which is the first left turn, turn, turn left on County Road 20, go down. You'll see the stallion station driveway, sign and state driveway and we're like maybe 20 or 30 feet beyond that onto the left. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, just get a full tank of gas and go for it. Um, oh, from, from I it's, 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 a t <laughs> it's a 10 minute drive and it doesn't take yeah. that much gas. Yeah. <laughs> I drive it like on, First time I went out there, I, I was on a, a tour. <laughs> so I found Nancy. it, yeah. Um, okay. Could you say the names of the people who are studying the Black Thebes, if you, if you uh, know them? I actually don't. I don't. I didn't bring. I don't know their names. Okay. Um, or, or, uh, Felicia is working with them. Okay. So, but I can get them, and I can send them to Ken, and he can share that with you. Great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So Nancy, thank you very much for taking the time to to speak with us to speak with us tonight and and just share the fun things that are happening out there and also probably some headaches I'm sure but uh, it's it's kind of cool to have a place like that close by uh, taking advantage of the area in terms of uh, restoration and education. Thank you so much. Well, great, thank you, and please if you have any ideas or if you would um, or if or suggestions on, on what we can do. Uh, uh, certainly with um, birding programs and stuff, we're, we're all ears and uh, ready and willing to, to work with you all. Okay, we got all folks right, thank in, thank you, you, and they're gonna check it out. And, okay. And so, so I will turn it over to the boss. Uh, Nancy, you're, you're welcome to, to remain with us. I uh, will probably and, just go ahead and say, say bye because it's a <laughs> okay, hour day you. for me so right. thanks a lot thanks. everybody thanks All right. Nancy. thank bye you bye. and back to you did you we have a little time left do you want to see if people have some sightings they want to share well sure but we don't have zane tonight do we no uh i think maybe the he, first uh, time he has yeah he, he actually did not make it in yeah well he's a college student now you know, yeah, <laughs> but he always knows what's going on. I know is uh, Sammy. Are you there? Because you're always out and about. Yeah, she was uh, there earlier. Yeah, if only Michael Perone was on, he knows what's going on. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Hello. His name's still. Okay, I'm, I'm on now. Michael, um, uh, 
I think the big news is there have been single evening gross beaks in the gross area, beak, yeah. mostly one day at a time. There was one in North Woodland a few days ago in uh, Beamer Park that was seen for two days. There was one near Birch Lane School in Davis that I think was only seen one day. And there was one, I believe, today at UC Davis, you know, flying over one of their buildings, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's probably been the biggest, the biggest recent bird news for sort of surprises, anyway. Yeah. Because there hadn't been any evening gross beaks, I think, probably for a few years. Yes. Uh, I re remember when I was working, there was some that were spotted on campus and that was some time ago. And I think there was one that was a, a one hour wonder, I think in Mace Ranch some a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. Yeah, th those are cool birds to see. Yeah, great. Um, let's see, anyone else? There are still, there are still mountain plovers along Highway 45, just south of the Calusa County line. Okay. Those who, those who know how to drive up there and not get their car stuck in the mud on the road, children. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be pretty soft these days. Yeah. Um, now, Michael, uh, since you're, you're here, I want to throw this out there. And looking at the listservs, uh, <clears throat> Trumpeter Swan, not Trumpeter, but yeah. Yeah, Trumpeter. Trumpeter Swan seem to be popping up. Uh, in the valley in different places. I mean, View County always, but I think some other places I was seeing something over in the North Bay. Uh, I don't know, based on, on, on your knowledge and your, 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 his, your historical information, is it odd that we have that many being reported or is it just more birders, you think? Um, I'd say three things. One is that there's been a pretty big recovery effort on trumpeter swans, and there are steadily more of them available in the Western United States. So in that sense, it's not so surprising that they're spreading around some. Uh -huh. Secondly, there are a heck of a lot more birders than there were, say, 20 years ago, probably 10 times as many. Yeah. The third thing is that it's a darn hard bird to identify, and... Um, it hasn't been real clear to me how people decided which ones were trumpeters and which ones were sort of on question marks. Right. There were a couple of reports in Yolo County in the last week. And I think there was kind of no consensus on whether they were trumpeters or, or, um, or uh, tundra swans. And um, I, I, I don't have much of an opinion uh, the, the thing is, there isn't really a single field mark other than their voice that is 100% reliable. Mm -hmm. and so, and nobody ever hears them call around here that I'm yeah. aware of. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very, a very tough ID, I think. And uh, even though there are, you know, descriptions of the differences they're, you know, we're talking really small differences. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, I know there was one reported in um, somewhere in Sonoma County, I forgot where, and people seem to think it is a Trump or Swan, but I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and it's hanging out, and there is a, a, what, an immature tundra hanging out with the one in Sonoma County? Well, that would be helpful because if you have them side yeah. by side, presumably the trumpeter is a bigger bird. So yeah. that might cinch it in the Northwest yeah. where both species are, where I've seen them, the trumpeters don't mix with the tundra swans. They are in their own yeah. groups all by themselves and they don't talk to with tundra yeah. swans at all. And so you don't get to see the size difference. It's just yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, unless I made that up, my brain yeah, thought I read that. But there is that fellow yeah. in Butte County who is sure that he has several of them. Um, yeah. um, I'm trying to remember what road they were on, but I'm not remembering right now. Kind of yeah, west of Highway 70 somewhere. Right, right, and yeah, when I mean, you just have a little shoulder to look out. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyone else have some? Uh, uh, Thing they want to share about the birds they've seen or questions about some of the birds they they may have seen just joe zenko can you hear me yes joe 
And could Michael give us a rundown of the, of the about one month history of the summer tanager and what he thinks might be going on with that bird? It's a, it seemed like a very interesting thing. It's just hanging around at one area and using one one tree, but it's about to run it out of food there. If he would mind <laughs> telling us about that. Uh, there's not a whole lot to say. I found it on about, I think about the 6th of December or something like that. I can't remember exactly when. It stayed in the same general area ever since then. I saw it yesterday or the day before, I'm not forgetting. It's, it's a part of a route that I walk uh, two or three times a week, every week. So um, there's not much to say except that it appears to be settled in. You know, it's now that it's been here for five, maybe this is now six weeks, this seems to be its winter home. I mean, it's standard for a bird for migratory birds to have a home in the summer, a home in the winter, and where they are in the winter, that's where they stay for, you know, several months. Mm -hmm. So it may very well do that. Um, ordinarily, they are, you know, they're in like central Mexico and point south this time of year. So this bird is a very long way from home. Yeah. <laughs> that's about all I can tell you. Um, there have, there are a couple of recent I think there are two recent winter records from Sacramento County. They weren't birds that stayed that I'm aware of, but or maybe they stayed and no one could find them. Who knows? So yeah. it's not, it wasn't a big surprise to have one in Yolo since you know they've been in the area. Um, it's part of a general picture of rather southern wintering birds steadily, gradually wintering further and further north in California. This, there's a lot of species that are in that pattern. Um, Western tanagers, for example, a few of them are in the, spend the winter in Yolo County every single year now. Um, that would have been a big deal, you know, like 40 years ago. So, um, so that's a difference that affects lots of birds and not mm -hmm. just summer tanagers. But this bird is very, is very far out of that's, yeah, that's for sure. It should probably be but, in Mexico City. <laughs> Maybe there's no persimmons down there. Yeah. And I give it back to you. Uh, well, I thought that it might be good for you to tell people who's speaking uh, at the uh, at the what will that be the February talk, and the, then we'll give give everyone the rest of their evening back. Okay, uh, we have scheduled. Uh, Allison Key, uh, a UCD grad student who uh, is, I think she's uh, presenting her, her, her research this month sometime. And maybe by the time she talks to us, she'll be Dr. Key um, on nest boxes. I have a hard time saying that word fast. Hmm. Uh, I think she's worked, she has worked with Melanie and uh, and along with Melanie, uh, I know she has put up some nest, nest boxes in the North Davis Greenbelt. Uh, and I think it might have been further south of Grande and, and all the way up to the North Davis Pond and around the pond. And those, those boxes are, are bluebird and uh, tree swallow productive up there. So I don't know exactly what she's going to talk with her. What she's going to talk about, we're, we're plan on tuning that up later this month. But Allison Key from UC Davis. Right. Um, and uh, April, we will have uh, Rob Furrow and um, Cameron Tesher. Uh, they're going to give a talk on uh, a little project they did on uh, call identification of nighttime flying birds. Nighttime migrators, not flying birds, but migration. Um, and that'll be in April. And uh, unless there is something happens, we have, we're planning on members' memories in May. So tune up your iPhone photos and uh, put together a slideshow and with a good story. Uh, and March, I'm at the, still on the drawing board. So if any of you want to have something, that, interesting to talk about, educational, travel log, give me a holler. Good. 
Great. A bird travel log. I, I don't want to hear about statues. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's it, Ann. Thank you, Ken. You've done a great job as usual. And it was it was super to hear from uh, Nancy. I'm looking forward to uh, Yolo Audubon working more closely with her now that I see that she's so interested in, in birds and, and eager to have us uh, join them on more things. Yeah. I, I would like to say one thing about the, the Nature Conservancy. Uh, back in 1949, when Yolo Audubon had the uh, an education program, I went out and talked to the uh, education person of the day out at the conservancy, went out there on a field trip, took some time off from work and looking, you know, the goal was to see what each group is doing and see if, if somehow um, we could sort of collaborate on a program out there. Uh, then, you know, the next week that person was on a new job somewhere else out of state. And so I never picked it up again, but you know, there's uh, at least, as a as an organization, you know we have noticed uh, that there should could be uh, a working relationship with the preserve, and I'm glad we're 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 getting it done now. We at least got it started. It's great. So anyway, that's my two cents and in support of that. Great. So stay tuned. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Everybody it coming. See you sort of. <laughs> So anyway, take care. Have a rest, great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks. And you.